with all the news from WTCN-TV's expanded news-gathering facility. WTCN-TV, Channel 11. This is Channel 11 News at 10. The following program is a Carrie Levin News special presentation. That's not trying to be a hero, is it? That's just the way I am. They may live in different worlds. Oh, it seems intuitively the right thing to do. They all have something in common. I mean, this isn't just about wrestling. This is about life in general. I mean, I'll take this for another 60 years through everything I do. Something that sets them apart from the rest. I didn't know if he was going to live or not. I just didn't know. Go, go, go! They are courageous. Oh, no. They know what it's like to sacrifice for others. He makes every morning at 10 o'clock a great big huge adventure. <laughs> and their accomplishments touch us all. We call them heroes. Doing something you love to do, having fun doing it, show me a better way of living. Thank you for joining us. I'm Diana Pierce, and welcome to Carol Levin's Extra Extra, The Hero Next Door. We're looking back at some of Carol Levin's most memorable stories, stories of ordinary people doing extraordinary things with their lives. Some of these stories will inspire you. Some might make you laugh. Others might make you cry. But we think that they're all worth sharing with you one more time. Our first hero has a special touch that has helped hundreds of premature babies. He's not a doctor but he knows what special babies need to not only survive, but thrive. Here's Carol Evans, Lauren Glassberg. It costs uh, 50 bucks, I think, to get a copy of the tape. Monday morning in Hopkins. I would like to leave at the same time you would like to leave. The Dussals are planning their day. Both are retired now, but stay busy. Nancy volunteers at a hospice caring for the elderly in their final days. So tell me, how old are your children now? But Pierre prefers a younger crowd. Even after raising four daughters and looking after his grandchildren, he can't seem to get enough. So much so, every Monday he volunteers at the Neonatal Intensive Care Unit at Fairview University Medical Center. This is where premature and sick babies are nursed to health. Many are born weighing less than two pounds. Their lungs don't work properly and every breath must be monitored. And to ensure their recovery, rules must be followed. Chat hands become a uh, way of life in the winter time for me anyway. Only after Pierre scrubbed can he take a baby in his arms. I have Allison and she's all set. I changed her diaper. Oh, super. Allison Payne weighs just four pounds. Okay. There she is. Hey. That's twice what she weighed when she was born three months premature. Big mom, my goodness. Oh. oh, no. Holding babies is a far cry from what Pierre used to do. For 20 years, he worked for the Toro Company, purchasing parts for snow blowers. But now he plays with precious bundles, fragile babies. It seems intuitively the right thing to do. I think you should give back to your community. And uh, I think that being able to help babies or help anyone is, is something that everybody has a responsibility to do. But as he gives back, this 65-year-old also receives. I always sing to them. Now, sometimes the, the, my success is mixed because they don't all enjoy the French nursery rhymes, but uh, I like to do it, and I always talk to them. He talks about his own children and the family pets. And Maddie would just jump and leap, and then she would... Stories so soothing, he's got Allison literally wrapped around his finger. The feedback is, is pretty subtle. About 5% of all babies are born prematurely. That's about 3,500 babies a year in Minnesota. And even with all the medical technology, it's something as basic as touch that helps them so much. And we feel very, very strongly that nurturing these babies, giving them the most fundamental um, part of human relationships, that of touch, is extremely important for these children. It's okay. It's all right. Fifteen years ago, babies born three months early often died. 
Now they have a 95% chance of surviving. You can be okay? Huh? You can be okay? Pierre has cradled about 150 babies since he began volunteering at Fairview University. He likes to be held on your shoulder or wrapped in your arms, either way. All right, I'd just do it this way okay. if it's okay with you. That's fine. Will Raggetts was born 10 weeks early, but he's filled out, tipping the scale at more than 7 pounds. Oh, what a grip! The babies inevitably make their way home, but they've left an imprint on Pierre's heart that keeps him coming back. Can smile. Can you smile? As long as I'm strong enough to hold a four or five pound baby, I guess. You know, I can't imagine stopping them. I like it too much. And Anne, and they would love to. And Pierre joins me now. Thank you for joining us. Fabulous yeah. story. I know you call this a hobby, but are you still working in, on on this hobby on rocking babies? Oh, indeed. Babies? Yes. Every week I, I go in and uh, enjoy it immensely. And it's certainly more a hobby than than work. Uh, in what sense is it more hobby than work? Well, it's a relaxing way to spend a, a pleasant morning doing something I truly love. Now, when we first aired this story, the hospital had a tremendous response. What happened? Well, as I understand it, after it aired, they received something like 140 inquiries about volunteering in that sort of a position. And I believe that since then, they've had as many volunteers doing this as they can use. So it was very successful in that regard. And how does that make you feel? Very good. I'm well pleased because I think it's such a worthwhile thing, and it's a shame if there aren't enough people doing it. Now, how did you get started with this to begin with? Well, my wife volunteers in another area of the hospital, and when I retired, she'd heard about the Father Goose program and suggested that it would be something that might be of interest to me, and I checked it out, and I thought it would be terrific, and I began doing it. Now, we're in rocking chairs, and you're... You're just rocking away. Is this something that just comes naturally? Yes, it's almost a reflex. <laughs> my arms feel empty, but... And what, what's your special technique for calming that oh-so-fussy baby? Just a lot of cooing and touching, and um, I, I, I'm quite successful at it. It's honestly one of the things I think I do well, and I get great satisfaction from a problem baby and quieting it down. Mm -hmm. and, and could new moms learn quite a few techniques from you? <laughs> I think mostly to not be intimidated that the babies will in time settle down, and uh, it is really um, just takes patience. And because you are retired, do any of your buddies give you a hard time? Oh, come play golf with us, you know, <laughs> leave the rocking chair alone. Well, there's some question about why on earth am I doing this uh, when, when most people are, are finished with that phase of their life. But uh, I missed it, and I'm very happy to be doing it again. Thanks, Pierre. Still ahead, more stories of inspiration. We'll meet a movie man, a mailman, and a mom, a truly amazing mom. And I'd like to introduce you to one of my own heroes, just ahead. You know, when somebody comes into my theater, he's got four kids, him and his wife, I tell him, pay me for two of them. You know, and that's not trying to be a hero or anything. That's just the way I am. He's known as Stan the Movie Man, and he is a hero to film buffs and families in one small Wisconsin town. Stan McCullough is doing something that's practically unheard of. Imagine going to the movies and seeing the latest hit films for just $2. And add $1 more and you get Coke and popcorn. If it sounds impossible, then you haven't been to Stan's place in River Falls, Wisconsin. As Carol Evans Boyd Hooper tells us, if you're willing to take a little spin, you can save a whole lot of money at the movies. Yeah, I wish you'd come along. Usually here early. From the day he first pulled into town 26 years ago, Stan McCullough has had an impact. There he comes. And not just on the curb. I do impersonations of him parking the car because it's like Flintstones. But before you meet the man behind the wheel. Very. Very special. You gotta hear what folks in River Falls oh, Christ, it don't come any better. are saying about him. One of a kind in this day and age. The man they call Stan. None of them are true. <laughs> the movie man. Something about this town he loves. And to see them flock, the town loves him back for who he is. Seems like their eyes is aligned. And what he does. Four dollars. There's five. Four bucks a head is a bargain for a movie these days. Thank you. But at Stan's theater, 
it gets in two. Two bucks and a dollar for kids. We always laugh because it always costs more for the babysitter than it does to go to the movie. <laughs> First run movies at prehistoric prices. Here in the theater in the United States, charging two bucks for Lost World. You know that as well as I do. And on the subject of Lost Worlds, welcome to Stan's concession stand. 30, 40, 50 if you want it buttered. Popcorn starts at 30 cents a box. Soda tops out at 40. What the hell would I do with more? I'm kidding. I got my kids spoiled brat, uh, bad now, you know. And the help don't need any more money. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> Part of the reason this works is upstairs. It's fitting that you should be here looking at the dinosaur movie because we've got a couple of dinosaurs right here. Franklin Roosevelt was president when Stan's projectors were built. Stan keeps things low tech. When people ask me how long is the movie, I like to tell them about a mile and a half. He also keeps What's a second job. A lot of pictures. By day, you'll find him on Hennepin Avenue, downtown Minneapolis, booking movies for other theaters, Salute. making enough money to keep his first love afloat. You know, when somebody comes into my theater, he's got four kids, him and his wife, I tell them, pay me for two of them. You know, and that's not trying to be a hero. Either. That's just the way I am. At age 77, the way he's always been. David, turn it up a little bit, will you? You're goofing off in there, and you're misbehaving. He'll grab you right by the ear still. I always get a big hand, of course, <laughs> from the adults. All right, you kids, sit down, shut up, and watch the movie. <laughs> A theater full of people watching the movie, and Stan McCullough feels like the richest man in River Falls. Doing something you love to do, having fun doing it, show me a better way of living. There isn't. Oh, and by the way, in case you're wondering, yes, Stan's movies are still just two bucks. And one other note, a few years back, the citizens of River Falls named Stan their Citizen of the Year, but the Chamber of Commerce had to change the rules to do it. That's because Stan lives an hour away, in Fridley. Well, they may have different professions, but Stan the Movie Man has a lot in common with Dave the Mailman. They're heroes of a different kind, the kind that make us smile and simply feel good about life. We first met Dave Antoine last summer. He's a mailman in Edina, and each morning his arrival is more anticipated than the mail he brings. Carol Evans' Brad Woodard shows us why. Neither rain, sleet, all right, bombs away. Nor magazines. His record is 65 magazines in one day. That's incredible, isn't it? Can keep Dave Antoine from making his appointed round. People in the diners get a lot of magazines. Nobody likes working in this zone because it's so heavy day after day. Day after day, he delivers a stack of mail 18 feet high. I right, definitely wear a fella down. I have one of the uh, longer heavier walks in this zone. It's a war zone, and Dave not only preps the, only the mail, he preps for battle. About the only way I make it through a day is when I see all my little buddies out there in the street. Out there on the street, his little buddies lay in wait with one objective. Squirt, Dave. I get all gunned pretty bad. All of our guns put together a lot better than his. The kids get bigger, they get bigger guns, so I had to have my wife to get out and get me a one that I could defend myself with. In most neighborhoods, it's the male they wait for. In this neighborhood, it's the man who carries it. The kids literally wait for Dave to come. You guys stay here! In mass group, they run, Dave! Here. Go, go, go! Get ready, get ready! Oh, no, not in the truck! <laughs> Don't get that truck wet! Oh, this is not fair at all. It's not pretty in some ways. It's a different twist to mail carrying, wouldn't you say? This is uh, what I mean about being under gun. It's just kind of sweet. It is very sweet. <laughs> Protect me. He makes every morning at 10 o'clock a great big huge adventure. <laughs> it's pretty tough some days. Dave has been delivering the mail and smiles for over 20 years. Did you find your way over here, huh? And while he and his wife have no children of their own, I've always loved kids. There's no shortage of children in his life. There's about 80 of them out there that I know by name that get a tootsie roll from me when I see them. Okay, there I go. And about 50 dogs that I know their names. You be a good boy today, huh? Yeah, a boy, Glister. Amber's been my friend for six years that I've been on this route. 
She waits for me faithfully every day. 80 kids. Thank you, Rosie. 50 dogs. Did you want a treat today? And one ferret. Look at that. It's that over the sweetest Which little one? thing. This is zucchini. Zucchini? Do they eat Tootsie they Rolls or do they eat dog biscuits? Hold it up again, Claire. Ah, girl, thank you. You might say Dave. You get a lot of magazines, don't they? And another one. Is the Pied Piper of the Postal Service. A couple more houses and then we move. He's just so kind and kind to my kids and the kids in the neighborhood and dogs and so it's, it's fun to know him. Mailman Dave would be the first to tell you. One, two, three. Go. Go, on, William. It's a two-way street. It gets you through the day, and um, I just love him dearly. We love you. We recently caught up with Dave, and yes, he's still delivering the mail and handing out Tootsie Rolls and soaking the neighborhood kids with his squirt gun. And since his story first aired, he's become quite the celebrity. I couldn't believe the amount of people that would drive by and were actually looking for me. And they'd spot me and ask me if I was Mailman Dave, and they recognized the neighborhood, and they couldn't get over how you know, nice I was to the kids and dogs and stuff. And uh, uh, one lady, a school teacher, she, a fourth grade school teacher, was looking for me for three days. Of course, I took a lot of ribbon from the guys at work, but uh, they all call me Mailman Dave now, and it's, uh, but you know, that doesn't bother me. It's fun watching them grow up. It's fun watching them learn how to ride a bike and get rid of the training wheels and get their first teeth and uh, be at the door. This little girl come running, just covered with bubble bath one time. And she had heard me at the door, so she jumped out of the bathtub and her mom's at the door with me. And next thing you know, we got this little, little girl alongside her. She's about three years old, all covered with soap suds and uh, wanted to get her a Tootsie Roll. Yeah, it's, it's fun. But I uh, never thought of it as being a hero, just, just their friend, I guess. Welcome back to Extra Extra. There are many big league sports heroes in this world, but one Wisconsin teenager is in a league of his own. Kevin Black of River Falls didn't lose one wrestling match in his entire high school career. His courage and determination made him more than just another athlete. As Carol Evans' Greg Vandergriff tells us, even his toughest opponents have kind words for Kevin. An undefeated season is going to end in a state championship, and he may get a pin to do it. On a winter weekend, Wisconsin lines up for history. There isn't anyone better than him. Try that. He's just, I don't know, <laughs> he's just good. Uh, Kevin, Bla Black. Kevin, Kevin Black. Black. Kevin Black. If he wins tonight, he'll be the first Division I four-time state champion. Inside, more than the state wrestling tourney waits. Don't push. It's a chance to see perfection. There he is. Far from the noise, River Falls senior Kevin Black takes the final steps towards that final title. No different than any other day. But Kevin's different from the rest. Not one high school loss. That's never happened in Wisconsin Division I. I don't put any more pressure on myself. Grab the head! Been waiting four years for it. Go get it done. 13,000 fans fill this University of Wisconsin arena, including some proud parents. Really neat. It's, it's unreal to have all this support behind your child. Come here, bud. Rock the house, eh? Cowboy up. We just watched eight seconds. Ron Ryder the bull kicks some ass. Okay? The 119 pound championship match. For Kevin Black and opponent Jay Heal, time to write history. We gotta get hungry! Watch this. Black quickly shows his skills. Go! Those tourney skills come from years on the practice mat. Come on, come on, come on. And a daily training commitment. Average three hours a day. Lots of wrestlers work hard, but Coach Dave Brandvold sees the intangible in Kevin. I, I think it's a challenge. God dang it! Like that. I hate losing more than I love to win, so I mean, that's going to keep me going longer than, longer than anything in every, every, everything I do. Uh, these are some of my medals. From his closet, Kevin pulls the spoils of many victories. Hidden hardware that means little. I get the satisfaction out of, out of the thrill of winning and, I mean, the, the accomplishment of my goals, rather than getting, getting a little, little tiny piece of metal. Still, Kevin's parents display his state titles, his perfect record, but Kevin pins it all in the past. I mean, I've thought this forever, that records don't mean anything. I mean, on any given day, anybody can, can get beat or anybody can win. Use it, use it, use it, use it. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. That championship Saturday, Black's brutally businesslike. Double gotcha! Stay to the side! Come on, kid, 30 seconds left here. Black cruises 13-4. <laughs> History's written. Four years, 158 and 0. Oh. With your family, you gotta enjoy this one. Let's go. Let's yahoo, go. yahoo, yahoo. It's so great, honey. <laughs> Across the mat, all. Oh. He's gotta drive. He just keeps going and going and going. I don't know. He's a work of art. I mean, this isn't just about wrestling, this is about life in general. I mean, I'll take this for another 60 years through everything I do, so that, that's what all the hard work's about. One, two, and three. Thank you. A young man without equal in Wisconsin wrestling history. We did it. Greg, that was an amazing story. Why don't you give us an update now on where he's going to school and how he's doing? Kevin is at the University of Wisconsin, and he wrestled on a scholarship uh, this first year. Uh, he still was, was successful, but he finally lost. Um, his actual record was 18 and 16, so that's a big change. Yeah, a little disappointing, perhaps. <laughs> a big change from high school, but uh, he still had some great success. Uh, he was one of uh, two true freshmen to make the Nationals, and he's also on the National All-Rookie Team. Mm -hmm. How do you think that he inspired those around him? Uh, you could just see it in the locker room, even at the state tournament there last year. Uh, people uh, gravitated towards Kevin, and, and they just, I think, want to be like him. Uh, they strive for the same excellence. Mm -hmm. He's an incredible kid. How did he inspire you through all of this? The, the thing that shocked me the most was when we went uh, into his home and, and downstairs to his bedroom, and he had all the medals in that box in, in the back of his closet. I mean, way back. He had to dig and reach to find those, those medals. And, and again, uh, those medals aren't, aren't the point of what he does. He just wants to be the best. He seems to be very modest in, in that particular sense. Yeah, very, very modest and, and a great young man to be around. Uh -huh. Good things from him from the future, perhaps? I, I think the future looks bright. I mean, he has had great success so far in making the national all-rookie team. It looks like that his success will continue. All right. Thanks for joining yeah. us, Craig. Sometimes stories touch us in ways we can't explain, and we've had plenty of those here at CARE 11. But we'll always remember three in particular. They are the stories of heroes taken from us far too soon. But even in death, the lives they lived continue to shine on. They tried to get it all, but uh, they obviously didn't, so. Packing a lunch of crackers and pain pills, Dennis Frederick can be certain of only one thing. Have a hug. Bye. Bye. That more than anything on earth, he loves his family. Mm -hmm. I come and see you today. He says goodbye before the sun rises. And then Dennis gets ready to give another sort of love. It's cold in here. To a room full of third graders. I have to keep it cool for the crayfish, but... The crayfish are a science project. Part of their habitat is keeping them in cool water, so we... Dennis warms the room by greeting every student individually. Hi, Mike. Hi, Amy. The quiet girl. Ashley, are you waste baskets? <laughs> Dennis teaches the children responsibility by assigning each of them a different task. Who uh, will do a great job just like Alyssa did yesterday? Here, Amy. Cooperation and creative thinking are rewarded with wows, a chance to win a treat later in the day. Jacob. At I the beginning of the your, school uh, year, Dennis told his kids, Gio gently but yesterday. frankly, that he is that very sick. Cancer is something that has, has taken over my body and is eventually going to take uh, my life away. He's been a role model to a lot of kids, uh, a lot of teachers, a lot of, a lot of people in the community. The role model takes a quick nap after lunch while his students are at recess. Hey, Justin, bring him up. Then it's back to class again for the afternoon. Hey, is it okay to be afraid? The dentist knows someday soon, sure. too soon, he'll have to say goodbye. He wants his farewell to the kids to be short and sweet. It's time, my body has said, um, that I can't be here. And, um, Enjoy you kids, that I can't be here and uh, teach you like I've been the last few months. 
Dennis Frederick passed away March 23, 1998. He was a third grade teacher whose very life was a lesson in courage. She was the little girl who loved the Wizard of Oz and birthday parties, who had to undergo a dangerous blood cell transplant to try to fight a very rare and ominous form of leukemia. That was in January. For weeks, she battled the disease, but setbacks outnumbered victories. I haven't heard her voice since February 16th or seen her smile. She was very sick. Eventually, the messages posted on a website her parents have used to stay in touch with family and well-wishers sounded more and more ominous. I guess that was the first time that I really lost hope and kind of thought that she might not be okay. Sue Jenkins is a neighbor who, along with the Maple Grove Moms Club, appealed back in January for potential bone marrow donors to come forward when Kylie had no available match. Kylie's plight prompted more than a thousand volunteers to sign up to be screened here and across the country. Many more were turned away because of the overwhelming response. Meanwhile, Kylie's doctors pinned her parents' hopes on a more readily available umbilical cord blood transplant. I never expected to lose her. I never expected to lose her. I thought she was going to fight to the end, and I thought she was going to make it, but she didn't. But I want people to know how important it was for her to have people out there donating for one thing because there's many other kids out there who do live from this and that they need people to go out and donate. The last message on her website tells of Kylie's passing and says thank you for your love and prayers. Today, her mother had another message. I want people to know that in Kylie's name, I want other lives saved because, of, because people went out there for her to try and help her. That's a lot of good to accomplish in just three and a half years. Cross the street. Hard to imagine 120 seventh and eighth grade students, teachers, and chaperones sneaking anywhere. But these folks were conspiring to spring a big surprise. Where are the signs? We really miss this language. She made us really care about the music. She's a really good friend, also. Yes, we the room. 10 4. They were talking about Jean Lindquist, their sixth and seventh grade band teacher, who was wearing that mask to keep from being infected. You see, her immune system is down because of the chemotherapy she's getting for her leukemia. Oh, my goodness sakes, alive. <laughs> yep, they'd surprised her. One, two, three, four. <laughs> And they were playing a tune she'd helped them learn, the finale to the 1812 Overture. I'm feeling great today, feeling great. And I do have some hair. It was lovely. <laughs> and it was hard. The band members know their teacher is facing the biggest challenge of her life. They know her first three chemotherapy treatments hadn't done much good. They know she has a strong, positive attitude. All I think about is going back to see them. I want to go back and see them and let them know I'm doing well. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Barry. I love all of you. So I just sat there and figured if, uh, if God lets me to die, I'll die. If he don't, they won't. He was trapped inside a burning home with virtually no way out. And it would take a miracle and a last-minute hero to save his life. Last Christmas, a fire destroyed the Torkelson family home in northern Minnesota. Besides destroying every material possession they own, they were a few precious seconds away from losing nine-year-old Jake. As the fire raged on, Jake was somewhere inside the home, alive but unconscious. A relative in town for the holidays heard the family crying out for help. And he did what authorities say you should never do. Carol Evans' Mark Daly has more on this remarkable rescue. Never go back into a burning house. Oh, I'm in the sun. <sighs> the journey back is a painful one. There's nothing left. Yes. But no one here is complaining. Just something that reaches down and touches deep in your soul, I guess. 
It was Christmas, the night the Torkelson family lost it all. Nick's tackle box. The children's new toys, their schoolwork. I hoped my son was going to grow up with this gun and pass it on to his son. But not anymore. Everything. See the wood stove there, what's left of it. The fire started innocently enough. It wasn't much of a flame, just a little bit of a flicker. David Torkelson needed something to dump hot ashes into. Unfortunately, the pail he grabbed had a flammable liquid in it, and it spilled. I realized it was out of control, and there wasn't nothing I was going to do to stop it. And then I dialed 911. <laughs> Upstairs, Carol Torkelson frantically tried to wake up nine-year-old Jacob, who was asleep on a couch. Get on the David escaped out a basement door, but Carol and Jake were trapped. We couldn't come out the front door because the flames were coming up the steps there. As I come around the, that end of the house, why then I heard Carol in, the, in that back bedroom. My mom tried to open the slide door and it went open, so she started banging on it. It wouldn't open, it was frozen or something. I couldn't get that glass door open. As choking black smoke filled the house, Carol kept on pounding, even after she'd broken her arm and her ankle. But it was useless, and Carol prepared her young son to die. And then I just kind of sat down and thought, well, told Jake, <laughs> without even thinking, it looks like this might be it, bud. I was hollering at her to find the lock. Yeah. Can you get them out of the house? I go with it. Eventually, somehow, they got the door open and Carol escaped. But in the darkness and the confusion, Carol and Jake separated, and the little boy was still inside, all alone. Yeah. At that point, you're just in a panic. You don't know what's going on. And then I just searched around like this, and I just figured that it was a goddard because I couldn't find that window because the smoke was as black as night. I tried to get in through the glass door to get him, but then the smoke took me again and took me down again. So I just sat down and figured if, uh, if God wants me to die, I'll die. If he don't, they won't. God's will, the Torkelsons believe, sent help from the house next door. And the window shattered. That's what I seen Jesse and pleaded with him to, to get Jake out. I was reaching around trying to find him. I couldn't. Couldn't find him. I David's know. nephew, Jesse, had come running and dove in after Jake. I couldn't see nothing. I, I couldn't breathe. I was trying to hold my breath. And when I did take a breath of air, it just wiped me out. And I couldn't move. And I started to pass out. The flame was so hot, you couldn't go in very far. The heat had blast you back. Jesse's father desperately tried to help, too, without any luck. I was thinking, man, Jake, you're going to die. You're just too far back in. We're just not going to get you. But then, finally. I reached as far as I could. and I. I felt his face, I grabbed onto his coat, and I pulled his coat. Moments later, rescue workers arrived. When he got out, Jakey was just limping my arms. His eyes were rolled back. And I think, oh, man. Everything was kind of hysterical. Uh, I could see the fire from the highway, even. I didn't know if he was going to live or not. I just didn't know. Fire officials who arrived just a few minutes later say it's never safe to go into a burning building. We could have been pulling three bodies out of this house uh, instead of only one. But Jacob's mom says they had no choice. Could have lost them. So close. It was like to the last second that they got them out. And after all, the Torkelsons believe, God's will is God's will. <laughs> Telling this story proved to be quite a visual challenge for Mark and photojournalist Gary Knox. The fire had long been put out and the home had burned to the ground. But our crew used creativity, compassion, and kindness to bring this story to life. As a photojournalist, you always try to, you know, you hope to do stories that will teach, inspire, and uplift, and hopefully help the victims. And uh, at the end of the day, if, or after the story airs, if you know that you have done a small part in helping the viewers who you serve, then that really uh, makes you sleep good at night and makes you feel that uh, you're not just out uh, taking pretty pictures or out filling time that you're making a difference. Sometimes it's not easy, and uh, a lot of times the, the people you interview, they make, it e they make it a little bit easier, and the people we interview, they were willing, you know, they were willing to share their stories, and uh, 
and uh, one guy uh, got on the floor and, and, and uh, pretty much relived what was going on, what you know, went on through his mind. So when you get stuff like that on camera, you know that uh, it's going to work, it's going to uh, help uh, tell the story, it's going to make the, make the story an easier story to watch for the viewers. Well, I want people to understand that when I go on these stories, you know, I really, you know, I try to put, I always try to put myself in, in their shoes. You know, I want them, you know, I want the uh, people to know that I really care about the story that I'm telling. That's why I always try to listen to what they're saying real carefully and basically try to have a sympathetic camera. You know, let them know that I'm listening to what they're saying, I care about what they're saying, and, and hopefully the viewers will get that across. They'll care too. When we continue, my hero, when I was a kid, he helped me build my self-esteem. His story's up next. All my life, I've enjoyed being around horses, but it takes commitment and dedication to care for one. That's a lesson I learned early on from a man who's committed and dedicated his life to his cowboy kids. We all need heroes to look up to in our lives, and I've had the honor of sharing many of their stories on CARE 11. My heroes have always been my parents, but there is another who played a major role in my youth. His name is Tom Meyer, and he taught me riding lessons at his ranch in Exeter, California. But he taught me more than that. I learned self-discipline, self-reliance, and ultimately self-respect, lessons that would stay with me all my life. And when I fall down, it's Tom's voice that you hear saying, come on, get up, get tough, you can do it. I see a girl growing and I see her um, achieving self-confidence and things like that. That's the thing that I see. To understand Tom Meyer. Jennifer, let's saddle up, rattle up quick as we can. You need to meet the man. I'm, I'm an original. I'm an original. And hear what so many people have to say about him. He's not like other people. He's so different. He's a very special man. Special, not for what he does, but how he does it. What makes a good football team the team that has the best harmony going? They're all good. But at this ranch in California, you won't find any football teams. Here, horses and young girls team up and the results are nothing short of amazing. It's like jumping out of the airplane with a parachute. You want to be sure that you got the thing strapped on right. Now you start the trick right away. For more than 40 years, Meyer has taught little girls okay, to so ride big horses and perform death-defying tricks. Fine, okay, here you go. But the real lessons come outside the arena. Today, young people are, aren't with their parents that much mm -hmm. at a time when they really need to be, especially at the years 10, to 14, oh boy, they need to be with them. That's why only girls? Because a girl will give a horse a bath whether he needs it or not. <laughs> That's why. They would, they would rake up, they would clean, they would take, they would do detailed things. And I needed people to do detailed things. It's the detailed things that count. And a girl does it. Come on, come on. No matter the age, every girl must pull her weight. Cleaning, brushing, braiding, caring for the horses. It's all in a day's work, and no one gets special treatment. I should know. I spent two years with Meyer when I was a little girl. Oh, wow. Rad no king. Right, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Yes, rad no king. Oh, my God, my God. Mm. Now, that was my one and only horse show that I was at at, at Riata, <laughs> and I came in third. Oh, you got a good-looking hat on, too. Oh, I do. Well, there were always know. good times at the ranch. You know, I've been many times criticized for being so hard. Hats. Come on, hat, come on, hustle. And he can be tough at times, too. Meyer runs his operation like a drill sergeant. You really demand a lot from him, and you really expect a lot from him. <laughs> yes, I do. But, 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 but the thing is, the reason I do is because we're always out in the public. You go when I go. We represent uh, the American youth. We represent our country. And so it's so important that everything is understood. Five, six, seven, eight. He doesn't want us to be like other girls. He wants us to be different, like have manners and social graces. Hey! I've just had a wonderful life, and I 
and thankful that I had someone and have someone like Tom in my life. Hustle her up, don't drink it. Make her, make her, make her get after her. He doesn't want to just always be telling She's us, oh, good, good, you know. He wants us to learn from our mistakes. He isn't always just like really happy. He's happy inside, but he doesn't show it all the time. And his girls are happy too. And not just the young ones, but former students as well. Young girls who've grown up, who've written down their thoughts on Meyer in a special book. You learn loyalty, trust, self-confidence, and honor. And most of all, you learn to appreciate what God gave us to work with. How'd you feel when I called you up and said that uh, you were oh. one of my uh, my heroes uh, next oh, door? My God. <laughs> oh, I, I won't tell you what the girls know this, and I told them I was, I was almost, I was humbled. I was humbled, I was very humbled by that because um, it, 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 I don't do this for, for me. I'm not important. Uh, my, my feelings aren't that important. That little girl's feelings is what's important. They take me around the world. I'm nobody without that. Without that, what the hell, who, where would I be? I'd just be an old boy probably working at a feedlot. Tom Meyer has been touching people's lives for 40 years, and I'm proud to say that because of him, I have some cowboy values in my head and my heart. Ordinary people doing extraordinary things. That's what all our heroes have in common. Ralph Waldo Emerson once said that a hero is no braver than an ordinary person. But they are braver five minutes longer. We hope you enjoyed our program, and thank you for watching.